And we are back in the studio, and with me is Jane Linsgall. Jane, welcome to Fast Forward. Thank you very much, Mike. Now, your latest book from Tor is Five Odd Honors, yeah. which is the latest book in your Breaking the Wall series. Now, that's it, the, that Breaking the Wall, that ties to Mahjong. Right. And one of the things I found interesting in the series is that it was based on the Chinese kind of fantasy, the Chinese mythos, as opposed to all the other ones we see all the time. What led you to use that? Oh, well, the direct reason dates back to a Christmas Eve. Oh, can't remember exactly how many years ago, but a friend of mine, Patty Nagel, had an annual Christmas Eve party where people came over and, to play bridge. I'm a lousy bridge player, so I was refusing to play bridge. They said, well, play Mahjong. We were starting to play Mahjong, and someone was walking me through how to play, and they, you, the first thing you do is you take 144 tiles and you build them into a two-layer square. And they said, we're building the Great Wall of China. And literal-minded Jane said, no, that wouldn't work. The Great Wall of China goes like this. <laughs> it's not a square. But the character that is most commonly used to mean China is a square with a line through it. It means center, because China considers itself the middle kingdom, the center place. And I found myself thinking as I played this fun game, which is sort of like gin rummy with honor suits, uh, what kind of game starts with building the universe? And that puddled around in the back of my head while I wrote books about wolves and books about Egypt and books about color. And eventually, I did a lot of research and reading, and the pieces fell together. And a game played on Christmas Eve several years before became the jumping off point for a novel series. Yeah. Now, this series is about the 13 orphans. Right. And why don't you tell us a little bit, kind of set up the, the premise of the series, because I found it fascinating. Essentially, the 13 orphans are the descendants of a bunch of, I guess you could call them high-powered sorceress counselors to an emperor in an alternate China. And this alternate China was created in my universe by an actual fascinating historical event. The first Chinese emperor was, in, many people view him as a villain, but he was just an incredibly dynamic figure. And he, one of his counselors said, your Majesty, essentially, you're having problems because people keep telling you you're not doing things according to precedent. Well, the obvious answer is get rid of precedent. Burn all the books that do not support your point of view, and then no one will be able to cite anything. So except for scholars of the highest rank, all scholars were required to turn over their books and have them burned. Well, I believe it was 144 scholars refused and were executed. I looked at this and I said, oh my, we have human sacrifice in the protection of knowledge. In Chinese tradition, writing in, the act of writing in itself is considered magical. So essentially you have all of this highly potent magical material being destroyed, human sacrifice by those who would defend it. And that energy had to go somewhere. I've got a very literal mind for a fantasy writer. <laughs> in a sense, to me, it seemed more logical that that energy would have had to go somewhere and create another place or something. So that's where the universe that the 13 orphans came from. Generations pass. There are numerous rebellions, revolts, battles, because that is Chinese history in a nutshell. It's not the quiet, peaceful, wow, they've had 5,000 years of continuous reign. It's No, it's more like 5,000 years of upheavals where ultimately the bureaucracy wins and essentially conquers the conquerors. In one of these cases, the advisors to the king were given the option. You can be destroyed, your emperor can be destroyed, everything can be destroyed, or we'll exile the 12 of you to the original universe and everything will be peaceful. And they agree to be exiled, but they stole one of the infant children of the soon to be deposed emperor, who is the 13th orphan. 100 years pass, the descendants of those original 13 exiles have forgotten pretty much their heritage. Only a handful remain. Someone is stalking them. Why? Who? It's a 13, the book 13 Orphans is a race against time for the remaining orphans to find out who is after them before they can all be destroyed. And why? And why? Why? After 100 years of no one giving a damn, yeah. Are they suddenly being pursued? And what, one of the neat things about it is, while this is all a Chinese background, and I may want to ask you at one point about 
how much of what goes on there, the, the mahjong mm -hmm. as, as a tarot, mm -hmm. and the, the 13 orphans tying to the Chinese zodiac, I guess mm -hmm. it is, is real. But they, they've intermingled with, with other cultures, right. and so one of the 13 orphans that is tied to the zodiac, the dog, mm -hmm. is a black man. Right. You have one of the main characters, Pearl Bright, mm -hmm. who's the current tiger, is half Chinese, half Hungarian Jewish. Yes. You have the Irish background in what became the main character, Brenda. Mm -hmm. That, bringing in all of those other cultures into it, I thought was a great way to like, just open up the whole concept. I also think that being a mongrel is really the heart of the American experience. My mother is half Italian, half mutt. My father was half Russian the rest mixed up. I'm so mixed up, you can't say. It always bothers me, homogeneity. Homogeneity isn't natural to me at all. So of course my characters would have spent 100 years marrying outside their culture. Some stay very tightly within. Uh, Des, mm -hmm. his family stayed very tightly within the Chinese tradition. But it's the a majority- a great name, by the way. Oh, Des Lee, desperately. De desperately. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I know, I couldn't resist. And And, you, you bring it in with the, the, the classic Chinese zodiac, and like Brenda, when she's finding out mm -hmm. about her, her heritage in there and, and seeing the, the cloth they're using for the mahjong uh, tarot right. uh, divination, is sitting going, somehow it makes me think of food. <laughs> right. Because it's, it's the Chinese zodiac that's on every, every. Chinese restaurant menu. placemat, I mean, menu. Yes. So is, the, is there really a tie-in to the mahjong and Actually, that? there is a bridge. There ah. is, uh, if you play higher level mahjong, there are what are called limit hands. And limit hands are essentially a huge gamble to play because if you're saving those tiles for that hand, they're never gonna play out any other way. And there's a limit hand called 13 Orphans, which is essentially sets of pairs. And uh, as you know, since you told me before you play mahjong, Pairs are not going to get you anywhere in a game that requires you to get runs of three or sets of three or four. Pairs are going to completely mm -hmm. mess you up. So when I was going through my list of limit hands and I came across 13 orphans, and I remembered that the Chinese zodiac has 12, but in most tales, if you read of the Chinese zodiac, they begin by explaining how the cat was left out, why there should be, the cat should have been part of the zodiac, but at the last minute was tricked, usually by the rat, and uh, didn't finish the race or attend the banquet or whatever in the story, is the re how God chose the 12 animals for the zodiac. So there I had my 13, and the two meshed very nicely. Right, and then there's numbers in all the titles. Mm -hmm. So you have the, the 13 orphans, mm -hmm. and the second one was the uh, nine- Gates. The nine gates and five odd honors. Mm -hmm. My mathematical mind <laughs> says, well, they're each dropping by four, so I'm there not. should be a one. Just coincidence. <laughs> just coincidence. Just coincidence. I, was, I, I didn't even realize I was doing that. I was just picking titles that f caught my fancy. And I was talking to my friend Steve Sterling, who writes his SM Sterling. And he said, oh, so do we go to one next? And I said, oh, I hadn't realized. Yeah, and, and speaking of, you know, because your wolf books, all your other books are fantasy, I was fascinated to find that you do dabble in hard SF. Oh, yes. Because you write Honor Harrington short fiction. I do. How the heck did that happen? Uh, by wonderful, marvelous good luck. Um, David Weber and I had met at a couple of uh, science fiction conventions when I still lived in Virginia and he lives in South Carolina, and we were friendly acquaintances. Then one day I get a phone call and it's Weber, he goes, Jane, my car broke down. The sign says I'm near Lynchburg, and isn't that where you live? And I said, yep. And I said, where are you? I'll come get you, take you home. Well, he told me afterwards he expected me to point him to a motel and a garage. I took him home. I had a big old rambly house in the historic center of Lynchburg, Virginia at that time. He stayed for a week because his car was an old Volvo that they couldn't find the uh, part four, and by then we were really close friends. And uh, we've stayed good friends. We've been friends since he had one and a half books and I had one short story. Wow, that's In a fact, long time. <laughs> yeah, the first book I ever s signed was a 
copy of the short story collection with my first short story in it for the woman who would later become Weber's wife, Sharon. So um, when I was actually the godmother of the Honor Harrington anthology series because I knew Weber and I knew Steve Sterling and both of them are really great cooks and both of them make some of the most killer salads. If you turn them loose, they make the most killer salads you'll ever have. So I figured that these two guys needed to know each other. They both wrote military SF and were great cooks and specialists in killer salads. So while we were chatting, the subject of the anthologies came, possibility came up, and that's when this series got going. I was supposed to be in the first book, but got bumped to the second. And, uh, but I like blowing up spaceships. <laughs> I, I was wondering, is it, is it difficult for you to go from the, the fantasy element that you know, is what you're known for right. to, to do that really kind of hard-edged, military-oriented no, not really, because if, and I know you have, think about my books, my, even my fantasy is very practical. Yeah. Um, you're not going to have one of those awful fantasy moments of at, at the 11th hour, the character who had shown no magical ability suddenly acquires magical powers. There won't be a convenient earthquake to move the plot forward by forcing the characters who have now been separated. No, I'm really terribly logical and reasonable. And so switching between science fiction and fantasy isn't a problem for me at all because I don't like cheating the reader with a quick, nasty fix, whether it's fantasy or science fiction. Even the more outlandish things I write, uh, I've usually done a tremendous amount of background research. Right, and, and they are. They are they're rooted in, in what really, you know, given Given the fantasy element, what yeah. would people really do? Yeah. If a Mahjong tile bracelet yeah. is going it's a to beautiful bracelet, by the way. is going to encode a spell, I will know in detail how it happens, why it happens, and why you break when yes. you break it. That energy is released. Uh, I, I I can't do woo. <laughs> yeah. And my husband's an anthropologist, mm -hmm. and. So the two of us have talked a lot about magical traditions. And to be honest, the general new age, um, oh, magic should be sort of vague and wonderful and feel good, is not really how magic works in traditions of any culture that has a strong magical base. The Egyptians viewed their magic as a systematic science. It's not a coincidence that our word chemistry is descended from alchemy. Mm -hmm. uh, Magic should make sense, and in my opinion, for a good read to be a story, the story should make sense. Right. So whether I'm writing with, uh, you know, spaceships or uh, or w talking wolves, still it's still there. And one of the things in terms of story that mm -hmm. goes in in the books, and particularly in the Breaking the Wall series and in the Five on Honors, is there's consequences to what goes on. Mm -hmm. What I really saw in here was, Five on Honors to me was partially a book about unintended consequences. Yes. It's, a, it's a hard book. Yeah. It was a hard book to write because so many very bad things had to happen to characters I liked. And, and they find out that what we had done before that we thought was, was helping everything mm -hmm. was really could possibly destroy everything we yes. hold dear. That's why it's, it's unintended consequences. Yeah. Probably the, if I have a slight chip on my shoulder as a person who has become known as a fantasy writer, it's the automatic assumption that my books are soft, light, and easy. No. <laughs> and I don't think my books are soft, light, and easy, but I know there were people who have never bothered to pick up one of my books because they see the F on the cover for fantasy and say, oh, well, She's a girl, and it's fantasy, <laughs> and so there's going to be no edge to this. I won't like it, and yeah, that's, if I have a chip, yeah, it's that people won't even give it a try. Oh, there's an edge to this. I mean, all the characters have difficulties. They all have, there's, you know, mo you know there's no, no easy lives in this. Even, I mean, one of my favorite characters was Nyssa and her daughter yes. Lanny, but you know, even there, it's, it's oh, there's yeah. toughness in it, and there's danger, and people die. Yes. Yeah, and I, I don't kill characters lightly. I have, to my great embarrassment, been known, uh, you said you'd read the Honor Harrington pieces I did in the scene where the one character has a heart attack in the one story. 
I have to admit to my tremendous embarrassment, I was sobbing as mm -hmm. I wrote that scene. I get very involved in them. I can't do the, I've listened to writers talk in, on panels or in private circles about creating the character meant to die to break the reader's heart. And that makes me angry, actually. Yeah. My characters are real to me. And if I'm gonna break the reader's heart, my heart's breaking right along with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and there's stuff in these books that, yeah. that get to you. They, they really Thank do. You. I hoped, but you can't know until you turn it loose. Yeah, yeah. And, and the use of the dead characters in it, because there's, some of them are dead, and mm -hmm. then they kind of come back to life. Mm -hmm. And, and there, there's sacrifices made, and as they, it just, the, the land of uh, smoke and sacrifice and mm -hmm. what it's become was fascinating. The chaos there yes. was, you know, that was an interesting touch in it. Now, what, what gave you that? Um, a, lot of, a lot of different things, but maybe in large part it came from growing up in D.C., which was supposed to be sort of the font of order and organization <laughs> and the, the sense that when that order falls apart, uh, you do get chaos around the fringes, probably had a, had a big influence. Chaos interests me, mm -hmm. but it's got to be real chaos. It can't just be called chaos because that's a cute and provocative word, but really they all have their own words. I'm fascinated by the, the idea of you can't even trust where your next step will go. And that goes on when they get through the gates and they, they yeah. get there. They think they've got it all made, they're gonna walk through the front door and instead they find out the entire environment. They yeah. can't even be sure they're gonna be able to breathe. Yeah, and the world that they thought they were going to save isn't the world they that left. they knew any, they left and they yeah. don't know what's going on yeah. and, they, and it, it's their fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hard thing to take. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what, what's going on next? What are you working on, what's coming out? Oh. Um, I don't have anything large immediately in the works. The, uh, I, I've been working on a couple of on-spec projects that I have madly in love with. Um, I just finished a book called Sundial Ring, which my agent wanted to pre-sell it for me, and I said, no, this one is so strange, I can't write a proposal for it. I tried. Uh, I said, I can't write a proposal for this because how do you write a proposal that will encompass it's a book about a place where times cross. It's got timelines in at least three different time periods, four, no, four different time periods, and one that may not even really exist. Uh, you can't reduce that into uh, a you know, five-page yeah. pr proposal and, uh, and three chapters, please. Wow. So it I just decided to take the gamble and follow my artistic heart and write the book. And my husband's reading the manuscript right now, and my great delight is, oh! <gasps> <laughs> it sounds fascinating. I, I really like it. I, I, I hope I get to read it sometime. Well, I hope so too. It's, but it was my choice to not try and pre-sell it because I really felt that this was a book that would do better when an editor could have the whole manuscript in his or her hands and look at it than to yeah. try and, try so, and yeah. propose it. So well, I had some money in the bank and I just decided that art great. was going to win. That's great. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time. It's been lovely having you. I thank you for taking time out of your schedule here to, uh, to join us. And it was great having you at Fast Forward. I had a lot of fun. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you again. And so for all of us here at Fast Forward, this is Mike Zipser saying take care.